Exalted is a game known for cinematic action. In a previous video we spoke about Exalted stunt rules and how they were designed to motivate cinematic gameplay. Few things are more cinematic than a fast-paced fight scene. In 3rd edition the franchise tried a new take on combat that was both criticized for its complexity and embraced for actually succeeding to represent the cinematic fantasy of over-the-top action. This is the Pattern Spider, a YouTube channel about role-playing games, and this video will go through the basics of combat in Exalted 3rd edition. This will cover the fundamentals of combat as well as some suggestions for how to tackle combat at your table in a way that's simple and won't interrupt the narrative flow too much. In a future video we'll go more into depth about advanced combat such as the use of gambits and battle groups, I won't cover that in this video. Also remember to like, comment and subscribe if you like this video and want to see more. If you want me to cover other aspects of the Exalted game system in future videos, feel free to suggest video topics in the comments below. If you want me to cover completely different game systems, you may suggest those as well. I also have a Patreon where I frequently post previews about my original role-playing game Machineborn, which will be available for free once it's done. There are plenty of free previews there that you can access without having to become a patron. By becoming a patron you get access to some more in-depth previews. Before we start talking about combat in Exalted, I also want to remind you that The Realm has recently been released for Exalted 3rd Edition. It's the first major setting supplement for 3rd Edition, and it contains a lot of interesting information about The Realm that's useful for any campaign and not just for Dragonblooded games. I'm leaving a link to where you can pick up this book in the description below. So you're about to head into combat. You and every other participant in the combat roll join battle, which is your wits plus awareness, and add 3 to the result to determine your combat initiative. This is a roll that cannot be botched, and that's typically only rolled once at the start of combat, with exceptions only if some specific power or rule states that you can roll it again. If someone joins the battle later, they make the roll like normal and are added to the initiative order based on the outcome of the roll like normal, with the only difference that they were added in later. While many games that use initiative only use it to determine the combat's order of events, Exalted 3rd Edition has taken the concept of initiative and turned it into an active representation of the battle momentum, where characters with high initiative are controlling the flow of battle and those with low initiative are outpaced, outmaneuvered and cornered. Characters take their actions in order of highest initiative to lowest, while those with equal initiative act simultaneously. Initiative can and will change during combat, and different participants will bounce up and down the initiative order throughout the scene. But for now, when we roll during battle, we only want to determine the initiative order. The combat scene is a time when the natural narrative flow is interrupted and replaced with a specific order of events. It's structured in order to make sense of events and for the purpose of game balance. The combat scene itself consists of rounds, an abstract moment of time representing the actions of every participant in the battle. Throughout the round is a series of ticks, which are units of time that measure the initiative placements. For example, a character with initiative 7 takes their turn on tick 7 of the round. The turn is the moment during the round when the character declares their combat action. This turn may start on one tick and end on another, depending on if the initiative changes as an outcome of the player's action. However, even if the character is on multiple ticks in a round, they only have a single turn. Once you've taken your turn and changed your initiative, your new initiative will determine your tick on the following round. If you haven't yet taken your turn and your initiative has increased enough to be higher than others who have already taken their turns, you'll take your turn on the following tick. For example, if you have initiative 7 but someone with initiative 9 attacks you and changes your initiative to 2, you'd have to wait for tick 2 instead of tick 7 to take your turn. In contrast, if you have initiative 2 and someone with initiative 7 helps to boost your initiative to 9, you'd get to take your turn on tick 6 instead of tick 9, because tick 9 has already been and it's currently tick 7. I'm sure it all sounds complicated and raises a lot of questions about why the game puts such emphasis on the order of combat. The reason is that this initiative isn't just the order in which the participants take their turns, it's a resource in and of itself. The initiative is the abstraction of the battle momentum, and the characters strive towards higher initiatives so that they can take control over the battle. Once they have that control, or once they have enough control to attempt to overpower a foe, they can spend their initiative in order to deal actual physical harm to their opponents. This is represented using two different types of attacks. A withering attack inflicts damage to a target's initiative in order to raise your own, and a decisive attack spends your initiative in order to inflict physical damage upon a foe. A standard fight scene between two combatants consists of a series of withering attacks back and forth until one combatant has enough initiative to take out their opponent with one decisive attack. 
While the players are well aware that they are doing two different types of attacks, the characters in game are fighting to kill with every move they make. There's no such thing as a withering or decisive attack in narrative terms, they are all attacks. Though the withering attacks represent the over-the-top action where the combatants throw each other into scenery, cut, scrape and bruise each other until one of them is in such a bad state that the winner swoops in and decapitates them with one final cut. Withering attacks also factor in the advantages that combatants bring to the battlefield. The might of their weapons and the toughness of their armor, for example. The more advantages you have, the easier it is for you to steal initiative from your opponent and the harder it is for them to steal initiative from you. Because the decisive attacks are represented by turning points and conclusions to the battle, they are less dependent on the quality of weapon and armor, and more dependent on the situation set up by the withering conflict. The weapon damage has no bearing on the decisive attack, even though that attack is what's actually harming the target, and the armor soak gives no protection against it. Instead, the accumulated initiative is what determines the dice pool that's rolled as physical damage and that may kill the target. In order to resolve a withering attack, you roll dexterity with the relevant combat ability, which can be archery, brawl, martial arts, melee or throne, and you add your weapon's accuracy rating to that roll. The outcome of the roll must be equal or more than the target's defense, or else the attack fails. Defense consists of either parry or evasion, with parry being determined by half your dexterity plus combat ability rounded up plus your weapon's defense rating, and evasion being half your dexterity plus dodge rounded up minus the armor's mobility penalty. Ranged weapons cannot be used to parry attacks. Whether your withering attack fails or succeeds, the target suffers an onslaught penalty to their defense which reduces it by one until their next turn. This onslaught penalty stacks, making it dangerous to fight multiple enemies not represented by the battle group system, which we'll talk about in a later video about advanced combat. The amount an attack succeeds by is important as well, since the threshold of successes that go above the defender's defense value is added as additional dice to the damage value, which is what will be rolled next. The attack's raw damage is usually determined by the attacker's strength plus weapon damage plus threshold successes, though some weapons omit strength from the calculation and have it replaced with a set value. This is common for crossbows, fire wands and other weapons with damage not influenced by your own physical strength. The total damage is then subtracted by an amount equal to the defender's soak, which is to represent the extra toughness for wearing armor in battle. The final result is rolled, and the target's initiative is reduced by an amount equal to the successes on the final roll. The attacker's own initiative increases by an amount equal to the damage inflicted, but they also gain one additional point of initiative for hitting the target, which guarantees one initiative even if no damage is being dealt. In some cases, a defender may have more soak than the attacker has raw damage dice. The number of damage dice rolled is then determined by the weapon's overwhelming value, which is typically one for standard weapons that can be much higher for heavy artifact weapons. This is the basis of withering attacks. The important steps to remember is that attack rolls include the weapon's accuracy, the threshold successes are added to the raw damage, and the defender's soak subtracts from the raw damage before those dice are rolled. You gain one initiative for hitting your target and increase your initiative by the same amount you, dam you damage your target with. Now, if you would inflict enough initiative damage to take them down to initiative zero or below, they enter initiative crash. This gives you an initiative break bonus, which is an additional 5 initiative on top of what you already received. The character initiative crashes on the ropes. They are unable to launch decisive attacks because they have no initiative to spend. However, should the target you crashed crash you back, they instantly return to base initiative, which is 3, roll your own battle again and add the result to their initiative, and then get to make an immediate additional attack upon you. This is called an initiative shift. It's a very rare occurrence that almost never comes up, so I don't think you need to think too much about it if you're just starting out. If the crash target doesn't manage to get out of crash, they reset the base initiative after having survived three rounds in a crashed state. There may also be times when your own actions cause yourself to be crashed. This makes you immediately lose another five initiative that's either lost or given to the opponent that's most closely associated with the action that crashed you. But that's not an advanced rule that has little to no bearing on the game if you ignore it, so I wouldn't bother with it as a new storyteller. If you want to simplify the initiative rules as much as possible, I recommend ignoring the initiative shift rules, the extra initiative lost for crashing yourself, and the three rounds in crash and you reset rule. Instead, revisit them once you're confident enough in managing combat scenes that tracking initiative becomes second nature to you. 
New storytellers may have difficulty keeping track of the fluctuating initiatives, especially when there are several participants in battle. Everyone has their own way of solving this issue. I prefer to keep track of everyone's initiative myself so that I have a clear overview of the battle. I do this by writing down every participant in the combat and write their initiative next to their name. Every time their initiative changes, I scratch out a whole number and write a new one next to it. There are more effective ways of keeping track of things than I tend to do though. Something I highly recommend is that you place a paper on the table with numbers written from high to low. Every participant in the battle has a marker that's placed on this paper on the number representing their initiative score. Once they've made their turn, they turn their marker upside down to show that they've already acted. This gives everyone a clear view of everyone's place in the initiative order, and you don't need to make any notes at all. The only reason I'm not doing this myself is because I usually sit a bit away from the table where the players are at, but I think this is a, this is a superior system of keeping track of initiative if everyone is around the same table. There are plenty of ways to keep track of initiative though, so find what works for you and your group. Once you've accumulated enough initiative to want to go in for the kill, it's time for a decisive attack. These are all using dexterity plus combat ability, but don't take the weapon's accuracy into account. As long as the roll equals or exceeds the target's defense, you succeed, but the threshold successes won't affect your damage this time around. Instead, Compare your current initiative with the target's hardness if they have any. Unless initiative is higher than the target's hardness, the attack fails to inflict any damage. The actual damage rolled is equal to your current initiative, but tens only count as single successes. Hardness is one of my main gripes with this system. It's a trait granted by some magical armor powers to act as a barrier preventing characters with low initiative from inflicting damage upon the one with the hardness. The problem with hardness is that it acts like a barrier and not a soak, meaning that as long as your initiative exceeds it, you get to use your full initiative for the attack, increasing your chances for one-shot kill and reducing the chances of grazing blows. One of the appeals of cinematic combat is the idea that you can draw blood from multiple decisive attacks extending over a longer fight. As soon as the character has a high hardness, that's thrown out the window. Instead, you're facing an immovable object up until the point you exceed the hardness after which your attack will instantly kill them. Hardness is an atavism that survived from previous editions of the game, but it's poorly implemented with 3rd edition's combat system. I think that the game would be better by either changing hardness to act as a decisive soak or to remove hardness altogether. By changing it to act as a soak, it retains the idea that you need a high initiative before you can attempt to deal actual damage. The problem is that the powers that interact with hardness aren't balanced for this purpose. Even though I dislike the way hardness is implemented, I've been tolerating it for now and I'm running the game as written. But if I would rewrite the game, hardness would be the first to go. And if you'd think about house ruling hardness to act as a decisive soak in your game, I recommend cutting all hardness values in half to reflect this change. Hardness as written is often too high a number to act as a soak, and reducing those numbers is a good first step in balancing the system. If you fail to make your decisive attack and your current initiative is 1 to 10, you lose 2 initiative from the attempt. This becomes 3 initiative if you're at 11 plus. If the attack was successful, you reset your initiative to the base value, which is typically 3. If the target is still alive after this, you'll need to start withering them again for new initiative. Now, the damage you inflict on, a, on the target's health levels can be either bashing, lethal or aggravated. Bashing damage inflicts blunt force trauma, and while it can knock someone out when it fills their health levels, an additional bashing damage are converted to lethal instead of killing the target outright. Lethal damage inflicts bleeding wounds, torn flesh, and ruptured organs. When a target's health track is filled with lethal damage, they die. Weapons typically inflict either bashing or lethal damage. But there's a third damage type called aggravated damage that's most commonly applied using some kind of magical power. This works like lethal damage, but it cannot be healed using magic. There are many options apart from making attacks that make combat scenes interesting and engaging, but these withering and decisive attacks are the fundamentals behind the combat scene. Something you'll notice if you start using these rules as written is that many fights can tend to drag unnecessarily because withering phases become too long. In order to maintain the narrative flow and prevent the fights from dragging, I recommend that you separate important enemies from unimportant enemies. If you're fighting goons, let the players finish them off by crashing them, instead of waiting for their initiative to get high enough to deal enough damage to kill them. Instead, save the decisive attacks for the important enemies, like powerful supernatural entities, important story bosses and dangerous monsters. 
those are the kinds of enemies you want an epic fight against. If you're just going to kill guard number three to get into the palace, crashing them should be enough to deal with them so that the scene can progress without delay. If you're a storyteller who is unsure how to set up challenging fights, keep in mind that this initiative system makes it so that numbers are incredibly important. If you've got a full circle of PCs beating on a single lonely boss, that boss you've hyped up for several sessions is going to be withered into oblivion with no chance of getting back into the fight. If you want to give your exalted players a challenging fight, make sure that they are outnumbered or give some tools to your lone bad guys to survive against them. Exalts are powerful, and sometimes it's fun to let those powerful exalts completely squash their opposition, but that can also get boring in the long run. Creatures with legendary size are decent threats because they are difficult for players to crash, making it easier for them to retain enough initiative to be a threat. But if you want your circle of solars to fight a single abyssal mastermind, assume that your abyssal will be destroyed unless you account for their disadvantage. Maybe the abyssal mastermind has prepared some traps that can be employed to even the scale of battle. There are many ways to provide interesting and challenging fights for your PCs, and perhaps that can be the topic of a future video. The next time I talk about Exalted Combat, I'll be going into more advanced rules, such as combat movements, gambits, and if there's time battle groups. We may also talk about the weapons, armor, and their properties in more detail. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this video and want to see more. And until next time, see you in creation.